Today marks our journey to start the book of Acts. Um, now, in some translations, it's just called that. It's just called the book of Acts. Like in the ESV, which we read here, the church has ESV Bibles for those who don't have their Bibles, which is a good reminder. If you don't have one and you need one, raise your hand, and Gary will be glad to get you one. Um, but in some of the um, translations, like the King James and the NASB, it, it says the Acts of the Apostles, which is appropriate too, right? Either way, it's, it's fine. Um, the original book that Luke wrote was not titled. So these, the people that are doing the translations are putting a title on it. That's fine. In fact, there are some that argue that it should be, the name of the book should be the Acts of the Holy Spirit. Um, since the Acts of the Apostles were accomplished by the power of the Holy Spirit. So in essence, it's really the Acts of the Holy Spirit. And I like what uh, J.R.W. Stott says. Let me read what he says. He says, the most accurate, though cumbersome title, which does justice to Luke's own statements in verses 1 and 2, would be something like the continuing words and deeds of Jesus by his Spirit through his apostles. That's a mouthful. That, would, that wouldn't probably flow off the tongue very well, but, but it is a great title. He continues... Luke's first two verses are therefore extremely significant. It is no exaggeration to say that they are that they set Christianity apart from all other religions. This, these regard their founder as having completed his ministry during his lifetime. Now Luke says Jesus only began his. So the others, all the other churches or, or organizations said that their their leader finished his ministry, but Jesus has just started. Um, Luke says, uh, Luke says Jesus only began his. True, he finished the work of atonement, yet that end was also a beginning. For after his resurrection, ascension, and gift of the Spirit, he continued his work. First and foremost, through the unique foundation ministry of his chosen apostles, and subsequently through the post-apostolic post church um, in every period and place. This, then, is the kind of Jesus we believe in. He is both the historical Jesus who lived and the contemporary Jesus who lives. The Jesus of history began his ministry on earth. The Christ of glory has been active through his spirit ever since, according to his promise with his people, to be with his people always to the end of the very age. I love that. This Book of Acts is a continuation. Um, and although I, I do like that, I, I do like that title, like I said, it, it would be actually hard to write all of that and to refer to that every time. So we'll just refer to it as Acts um, to keep it simple for now. So several months ago, as I was, uh, I needed to figure out what we were going to preach on, what I was going to preach on next. After, the, uh, after we got done going through the attributes of God. And it became um, pretty apparent that the book of Acts would be a logical choice. And it, it does, as it does line up with my, my vision and my desire um, to, to see us as a church actually know God better and to... Um, go out and, and obey or to live out, if you will, the great commandment, the, the, the great commission. Now, I've, I've expressed this before with the illustration of up, in, and out, right? So we've talked about our, our reaching up, which symbolizes our relationship with God, and our reaching in, which symbolizes our relationship with each other as brothers and sisters in Christ, and reaching out, symbolizing our relationship to our community, in, in the book of Acts, we get all three of those. Right? We, we get, we get to, to learn how to be drawn closer to Christ and how to um, live a better life and to go out and to, to uh, proclaim the good news. Now, although all scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching 
as it says in 2 Timothy 3.16, no passage of scripture or no book in the Bible is actually more important than another, right? However, some passages are more appropriate for learning certain things at certain times. And this is the reason we're going to go through the book of Acts. We, we, could, we could go through any book in the Bible and it's going to be profitable, okay? The, um, and as I said, the book of Acts is, is going to help us live out our ministry of, of living up in and out for Jesus. So as we unpack this amazing passage together, I know that we're going to be blessed. We're going to be blessed to see the Holy Spirit work, um, just as he worked in the lives of the apostles and in the members of the early church. We're going to see him work here, here at Grace Fellowship Church in Preston. And with God's help, we will gain a better understanding of these amazing events and how we can actually take proper application of these events um, and see the Holy, trans the Holy Spirit transform our lives, okay? So I'm going to be setting the stage today as I introduce the book of Acts by giving a fair amount of just background information. So I'm going to go through a lot of facts and figures. Um, I think it's important to, especially as we start a new book, a, um, a new series where we're reading the Bible, we need to have context. Context is key, right? So we're going to spend a little bit more time than I normally would today going through some facts and figures. But context by itself, without application, isn't that helpful for us in our daily lives, in our daily walk with Christ. So we are going to get into some application today as well. So in addition to the context, I also want to stress one thing, and that's what it means uh, to be the church. So I, I, I boiled it down to a statement, to be the church, we must proclaim the gospel to the world. So when I'm looking at the whole of Acts, continuing from the book of Luke, which we'll talk about in a minute, all the way through, I kind of boil that down. It's it, to be the church, we must proclaim the gospel to the world. We're going to get into that in a little bit. Um, let's start with let's start with a prayer. I prayed for the prayer request, but we didn't pray for the sermon. Father God, as we are opening up a, a new series and we're going through the Book of Acts together as a church, I pray that you would give us insight, Lord. Um, there are, there are some things in, in the book of Acts, as we come to them shortly, that can be misunderstood. God, help us not to misunderstand them. Help us to take proper application of them. We pray that your Holy Spirit will bless us as you have blessed the church from the beginning as we are about to embark on in the book of Acts. In Jesus' name, amen. So the book of Acts is about the continuing words and deeds of Jesus. As I said, Acts is written by Luke, and it's actually a continuation of the Gospel of Luke. It picks up where, where uh, Luke leaves off. So Luke leaves off with the death, burial, resurrection of Christ, and then the um, and then the book of Acts begins with the resurrected Christ just before his ascension back into heaven. In Acts one, in the first three verses, we read, "In this, in the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach." until the day when he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He represented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days, 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. 
Now, it's agreed um, amongst the vast majority of all scholars that, um, that the, when, when, when Luke refers to the first book, he says, in the first book, O Theophilus, Luke is actually referring to the book of Acts. Or the, or I'm sorry, the, the Gospel of Luke, which he wrote. Um, one of the many reasons that besides the fact that, that the style of writing is the same, we can, we can look at the authorship and we can see that the style of writing is the same. But one of the, the biggest reasons is they're both addressed to this dude called Theophilus, right? And I, I have to admit, this, I, I didn't put this in, the, in, in my sermon text, but I have to admit, way back when I was reading the, um, the book of Acts and, and, and I would see this, you know, oh, Theophilus. I had no idea what was going on. I'm like, what's going on? Who's who's this Theophilus? What's what is Theophilus? I had no clue. So Theophilus is uh, is a name. It's it's uh, it is a person, and we're going to get into that in just a second. Um, but first, um, let me just point out that as I said, they're both actually addressed to Theophilus. Let's go back and read. We can see you can see this firsthand in Luke 1, uh, verse 3. It seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus. And keep that in mind too. Here, here in um, Luke, he says most excellent Theophilus. But in the book of Acts, he just calls him Theophilus. Now, Theophilus means beloved of God or friend of God, okay? And because of this, it is suggested that Theophilus is just merely a generic term for all believers, all Christians. And I think that's okay to think that because we can all take application, you know, if we're, if we're reading that, that Theophilus is all of us and we're we can all take application to that, and it could be as if it was written to us. However, um, it, it really is felt by most um, people that uh, it actually is a person. The Theophilus is a real person and, and actually a disciple of Luke. The title, Most Excellent, when it says in Luke 1, 3, Most Excellent Theophilus, Theophilus um, refers to... Is, uh, possibly a Roman official, but somebody definitely of high rank, right, of respect. You don't just say most excellent to, to anybody. So we're, we don't know for sure, but most theologians agree that um, this would be somebody of, of high rank and more than likely uh, Roman. Now, we also can see, we don't know for sure, but it, it looks as if Theophilus actually became a Christian. We know he, we know he was definitely not a, a Jew. He was a Gentile of some sort, <clears throat> Roman or not. And we, we can conclude that he did become a Christian by the term most excellent being erased in the book of Acts. So we could look at that and think, well, wait a minute. He was addressed as most excellent Theophilus here, and he wasn't here. So it's possible and he gave that title up when he became a Christian. And this is, this is speculation, but a lot of uh, theologians um, like to look at that as I'm reading through different things. Um, that became apparent. What is, what is pretty crazy, too, is that we don't really know who this Theophilus is, and yet he was... He was um, well, how do I word this? The largest portion of Scripture was actually addressed to this man. Because when we take the book of Luke and Acts and we combine them together, it's actually larger than all the writings of Paul. Because you, Paul wrote the most books in the New Testament. We know that, the most letters. But when we take a, just amount of words or volume of, of space, Luke actually takes the cake there. He actually wrote the most. And he addressed both of these books to Theophilus. Um, so I thought that was kind of interesting. Luke is a physician, so he's a doctor. 
And we, we get this from reading, we, we find this in Colossians 4.14. Where it says, Luke, the beloved physician, greets you, as does Demas. Another fact is that Acts is a history book. It's not only a history book, but it is a history book. It is, um, it, it's, it's gone to great detail to give us the history. Um, and, and as I mentioned, Luke, Luke is... I don't know why I'm nervous today. God, did somebody just pray for me? I don't know what's going on. Um, we love you, Pastor. Yeah, thank you. You're doing a great job, too. Yeah. Lord God, we just give you to ask you to pray for us. That you will just uh, take control of the situation. And that's all we're going to do. Amen. Thanks, Gary. You know that we're. I'm going to embark on a message here coming up soon, and maybe this is the reason that I'm nervous. Is it's it's very important. This we're gonna we're gonna. I'm gonna jump ahead just a little bit, go off my notes. We're gonna talk a bit about repentance and calling the church to repentance, and and I don't think that the enemy wants us to do that, and and that very well could be why I'm stumbling over my words and, and different things but but as we as as I mentioned Luke is a physician and he is more than adequate because of his education to write a book of history the book of Acts and the book of Luke um, let's read Luke 1 verses 1 through 4. So inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely, Oh, you're fighting me. Okay, I'll let you do it. it. It seemed good to me, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things that you have been taught. Now, of, there are occasions where Luke was present with, with Paul and, and with um, the other disciples, but he wasn't present in, in all things. So we know by his writing there that he interviewed the eyewitnesses who were there, who did see the death, burial, burial and resurrection of Jesus. So he interviewed these people, even though he wasn't there. And, and he did it painstakingly. He, he did it with, with accurate detail. Um, And like I say, he not only interviewed the the um, the apostles, but he would have interviewed Mary and, and the women that were there as well. He would have paid per careful attention to writing this account orderly and in consecutive uh, consecutively, so that Theophilus would have an ordered um, an orderly account of the things that he had been taught. And this not only helps Theophilus, but it also helps us, right? That, that, that Luke actually spent so much time in detail organizing and painstakingly interviewing and making sure he had all the facts right. Now, the, the chief purpose, if we're just look at the chief purpose of the book of Acts, it is to tell how Jesus' earlier followers, led by the Holy Spirit, spread the good news about him. Not only in Jerusalem, but in all of Judea and all of Samaria to the ends of the earth. <clears throat> we, can, we can look at Acts as a bridge. It bridges the Gospels to the rest of the New Testament. And without it, 
there would be a huge jump. We would we would go from we wouldn't even know about Paul, right? I mean, we we would just go from the ascension of Christ in the in the end of the Gospels to some dude named Paul writing letters and out on a mission. We wouldn't know how he got there, who he was, without the book of Acts. So Acts is a bridge that answers a lot of questions for us and gives us a lot of detail on the early church. <clears throat> for, for instance, how did the church begin? That's in the book of Acts. Uh, secondly, how did the church spread throughout the world? We're going to see some events that happened that caused people to get out of Jerusalem and, and to, to go on missions. So we're going to see that. Uh, we're going to see what obstacles and challenges caused the church to move. Another question is, who were the individuals who, used the, who, you, who were used in the expansion of the church? So we're going to get to meet some, some people who were used. Um, some of them actually died so that, that we could uh, have the gospel spread. We're going to go into that. How did Paul become an apostle? There's another good question that the book of Acts asks, answers. And how did Paul become so dominant? How did, he, how did he get such an important role in the church? So we're going to explore all these questions as we explore the book of Acts together. And I am excited. So Acts, um, Acts is an important book to show us how to live in church, how to be the church today. Some of these, some of the events that happened, we'll just clarify right up front, some of the events that happened were one-time events. And we can't reenact them or, or expect to see them happen exactly the same way. But the same Holy Spirit that caused those events still lives in the church today, lives in each of us. And so we can expect to see the same power in this church today. One thing we need to do is, is as, we're, as, as we're trying to figure out the church, we need to go back to the simple, the simple teachings of God. And that's what we're going to do over the next year, or however long it takes us to go through the book of Acts. We're going to get back to what the Bible says. And I'm going to talk a, lot, a bit about that in a minute. But first I want to read um, something that uh, a theologian, uh, James Montgomery Boyce, wrote. And he sums up the book of Acts very well. He says, a Christian, uh, he says, when I first began to study and preach on Acts, I was struck by a number of things. One was the rapid, amazing growth of the early church. Humanly speaking, it had nothing going for it. It had no money, no proven leaders, no technical tools for propagating the gospel, and it faced enormous obstacles. It was utterly new. It taught truths that were incredible to the unregenerate world. It was subject to the most intense hatred and persecutions. Yet, as Luke records its growth in this document, the book of Acts, it spread from Jerusalem which was an obscure corner of the, world of, uh, of, of the world to Rome, the world's capital, all within the lifetime of the first generation of believers. The second thing that struck me was a concern Luke had for the actual presentation of the gospel, that is, the early Christian preaching. His book is only 28 chapters long, but in those 28 chapters, he has included 19 sermons or formal addresses. In other words, the book is full of teaching, what this means is that was the way the gospel was spread in the first century church, or in the first, in the, in the first Christian century, and needs to be spread again in our time, is by the faithful teaching and preaching of the great truths of the Bible. There is nothing today's church needs so much as to rediscover the doctrine, spirit, and commitments of the early Christian church. That last sentence really sums it up. There is nothing today's church needs so much as to rediscover the doctrine, spirit, and commitments of the early Christian community. 
Now, I don't know how everybody knows, but I'm, I'm starting to get a lot more ads on my Facebook and my emails on church growth. Okay? And I, I, I brought one of these ads that I actually fell for the clickbait. I actually clicked on it because it lured me in. And I brought, them, I brought this up to the elders and we discussed it. And it's just a marketing tool. They, they teach you how to market um, to get more people to, to fill these empty seats. And although, although marketing by itself, I mean, it is absolutely fine, right? We, it, it's fine to, to go out on Facebook and to, to send out mailers and, and to get to, to go to the people. But we have to be careful. We have to be vigilant because it's easy to go from wanting to get numbers for the wrong reasons. And pretty soon we start making compromises and we end up like so many churches in America. And the, the gospel gets watered down maybe a little bit at a time because we're losing focus. We're thinking the focus or when we focus on numbers, right? And, and we focus too much on the numbers, that's what happens. Mm -hmm. There's a balance. There's a balance. And the only way we can maintain that balance is to have the Holy Spirit, it is to not compromise. We can't compromise. Mm -hmm. so, so we need to go out, and we need to use the tools that we have. And, you know, maybe we'll, maybe we'll use some of the techniques that, that this pastor wanted to sell us. But I don't think I want to pay the amount of money that he wanted. <laughs> but, but to use some of those techniques, that's absolutely fine. But we just need to keep that balance. And when, so we never compromise as a church. That balance, I believe, is summed up very well in that last sentence as well um, that James Boyce said. Well, we need to rediscover the doctrine. We need to rediscover the spirit. And we re need to rediscover the commitments of the early Christian church. The doctrine is, is, is simply teachings, right? Doctrine, it just means teaching. So, we need to understand what Jesus taught, not only while he was on the earth, but through his spirit to the apostles. So we need to, we need to take heed to that. We're going to see a lot of that in the book of Acts. We need to rely on the Holy Spirit. It's too easy to, to rely on ourselves. We need to rely on the Holy Spirit to do the work. We need to understand the commitment that these early church members had. They gave up everything for the gospel. They gave up everything, but they wouldn't trade it for anything. Because as they gave up everything, they were blessed beyond measure. So it, it really, as I mentioned this before, when we sacrifice something, it ends up not really being a sacrifice because God just blesses us all the more. So, commitment. It, it seems to me that, that our church across the nation, all believers, um, have a lack of commitment. I, I see that they have more commitment to television. I see they have more commitment to sports. More commitment to vacations, more commitment to children's activities, more commitment to almost anything except the gospel. It's evident in our church attendance here and throughout the nation. It's evident in our spiritual growth. And obviously it's evident in the growth of Christianity nationwide as we see the percentages of the uh, of Americans 
are less and less Christian and more and more what we call nuns. They're, they're the nun generation, meaning they don't believe in anything. They don't care. They're indifferent. They, they don't care if there's a God or not. That's, that's becoming the norm and the majority. So we're seeing, we're seeing this lack of commitment. Um, and we, need, we need to be the church. Have you guys ever heard that, to be the church? I, I, I heard this years ago, and it, it may be cliche, but I like it. To be the church. Not just to go to church, but to be the church. Reminds me of, of not just hearing the word, but do, being a doer of the word, right? So I, 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 I want us to be the church. We need to be the church. We need to be the church, not just go to church. We need to pray to God that he works in us today, just like he did the early church. Now, the book of Acts is about the continuing words and deeds of Jesus, as I have mentioned. Jesus' words and deeds have not stopped. Jesus is alive. Mm -hmm. The church is still under his control and his authority. It has never ceased and it never will cease. There was never a time in the dark ages or any other ages where there was not an authority on the earth, where there was not a church, God's church, the church of Jesus Christ on the earth. There are those that would, that would say different. Not so. We've, we've seen the church go through some tough times. Through the dark ages, it did dwindle. There, there were some tough times. But we've seen every time, and we can see it in the book of Acts, every time the church is brought down to its knees, it flourishes. And I just pray that we, we see that again at, here in America. As, as I believe we are, we are a crippled church. I believe we, we are not being the church as we need to be the church. The, the church as we are a part of today, like I said, has never ceased. Arthur Tappan Pearson, in his book, The Acts of the Holy Spirit, this is one who, who would, would like to name the book of Acts, The Acts of the Holy Spirit. He says, Church of Christ, the records of these acts of the Holy Ghost have never reached completeness. This is the one book which has no proper close, because it waits for new chapters to be added so fast and so far as the people of God shall reinstate the blessed spirit in his holy seed of control. Isn't that beautiful? There's a movement called the Acts 29 movement. Um, we could say we're Acts 29 because there's only 28 chapters in Acts, or I, I don't know, maybe we're Acts 357, or I don't know what chapter we're in. But the, but the book of Acts continues today because Jesus lives, and Jesus is here with us. So back to my statement, to be the church, we must proclaim the gospel to the world. We are the church, and we need to proclaim the gospel. This was told to us in the Great, in the great uh, Commission, right? In three of the gospels, the synoptic gospels. We do this in different ways, but we all are commanded to do it. Not everybody can be a pastor. They're not all called to be pastors. You don't have to be a pastor to proclaim the good news of Jesus to the world. You don't have to be any sort of paid minister. You don't have to be uh, a full-time missionary. Those are awesome. We need more. So if, if you do that, that's awesome. But you don't, you don't need to. God works in each of us differently. We're all in different stages of lives and different seasons. 
But we can't use that as an excuse to not proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. You might say, well, I, I have little children at home. I don't have time to go out and, and, and stand on a street corner and talk to my neighbor. That's great. Those children are your ministry. You need to proclaim the good news of Jesus to those children. And if for some reason you don't have anybody to talk to, you always have yourself. We always need to hear the gospel. So we need to talk to ourselves about the gospel. We go through those periods of time, right? And, and we need to give ourselves a pep talk. We need to get back into the Word and, and teach ourselves, preach to ourselves the gospel of Jesus Christ. So one way or another, we need to proclaim the gospel to the ends of the earth. So we talked about the church, being the church. But what does it mean to be the church? The church simply means to live, being the church simply means to live out the Great Commission, as I mentioned. Acts is a continuation of the Gospel of Luke, as well as a continuation of the Gospel of Mark, the Gospel of John, and the Gospel of Matthew. All of, um, and we see in the three synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we see the Great Commission. So let's look at each of those. They're worded a little bit differently. But they all say the same thing. Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20, reads, And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Let's look at Mark. The, the, the Great Commission is found in Mark 16, 15, 16. And he said to them, Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And then back to Luke, we find uh, the, the Great Commission found in the last chapter of Luke. Chapter 24, verses 44 through 47. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. And that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. As I said, the Great Commission is in each of those synoptic Gospels. It's worded a little bit differently, but the message is the same, right? Go proclaim the Gospel. Now, in, in the Gospel of Luke, he breaks it down into two things that we need to proclaim to the world. The first one is the work of Jesus. He says that Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. This is the gospel message, that Jesus lived a perfect life, that he died for our sins and hung on a cross, and that he was raised, lifted from the dead, resurrected, and sits at the right hand of, Jesus, or of God the Father. That's the one thing we need to proclaim. The other, <coughs> just, the other is repentance for forgiveness. This is what I was getting to earlier. This is it. Repentance for forgiveness needs to be proclaimed. In verse 47, I'll read it again. And that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. We also see in Acts 17, which will be to in who knows, six months, um, it says the times of ignorance in times, I'm sorry, the times of ignorance 
God overlooked. But now he commands all people everywhere to repent. It's not a suggestion. This is a, this is a commandment that we repent. And like I said, I, I think this is, this is key why the church is dwindling. Because we're watering down the gospel and we're, we're using the perforated Bible where we tear the words repentance out. We don't, we don't want to hear that. We don't want to hear repent. All we want to hear is the good stuff. God loves you. And he does. But we have to hear the whole story. And, 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 and God commands us to repent. So if we take that out, what do we have? We have a watered-down country club. We don't have a true a church where we're growing spiritually, emotionally, where we're spreading the gospel to, to our neighbors, our family, our friends, to all those. Everybody would be better off being in Christ, don't you think? Right? Rather than, rather than being in darkness and, and, and going to hell and spend eternity in hell. Hopefully this will motivate us to, to, to do this, to repent. I want us to all, just right now, along with me, to repent and to ask God for forgiveness. To repent for being uncommitted. To being uncommitted to making more, any other thing more important than the gospel. More important than being in a church. To being uncommitted to take our time to read scripture. God forgive us for not taking time to read scripture and for not making you the most important thing. We need to repent for not obeying all the teachings of Christ. We're just ripping out the parts that we don't like. We need to repent to prioritize church attendance, to not prioritizing church attendance over other things, other less important things. God forgive us. We need to repent for being uncommitted and sharing what God has done for us, as I mentioned, so that others may have eternal life as Jesus has given us. We need to repent for being uncommitted to meaningful prayer, true prayer, where we're praying without ceasing, where, we, where we, we're praying for repentance. We need to repent for being uncommitted with our finances. Boy, I'm guilty. We need to repent for being uncommitted with our time. And this one really hits me hard lately. We need to be repentant for our uncommitment to taking a Sabbath rest. And I'm guilty here, guys, because I'm, I've got a job, and I've got to prepare for, for Sunday, and I'm busy, and I'm not taking a, a, a Sabbath day <coughs> rest. I'm not trusting in God that he'll take care of it. I'm, I'm trying to do it under my own will. God forgive me for that. One thing I, I, I look at repentance and I, I, I think, yeah, God, it's one thing for me just to say I'm going to repent or, or I repent of these things, God. But I can't do that. I can't do that without him doing it for me. So I have to be humbled enough just to say, God, you have to do it for me. You have to help me repent. I'm so weak, I can't even do it. I'm, I, can, I can tell you, God, I'm going to repent. But then I go back and I sin again. I go back and do the same thing. God doesn't expect us to be perfect, although he, he does through Christ, right? He wants us to obey his commandments. But he knows we're going to sin. So what he's looking for is a repentant heart. 
We can't just go around saying, well, all, all my sins are forgiven, so cool. I'll just do whatever I want. I'll stay home today and watch TV. I'll, I don't need to give. I don't need to tell anybody about Jesus. I'm good. I'm saved. So the book of Acts is about the continuing activity of Jesus. It's about being the church. And the, being the church is living the commands of Jesus Christ. It is being on, on mission. It is obeying the great commission. Right? We need to proclaim the gospel. We need to be excited about it. We need to, it, it needs to fill our, our very soul. So I, I um, in wrapping up, I just, I just um, hope you understand that we can take application to these things. We, we didn't really get into the book of Acts very far. But we, 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 looked at, we looked at the Great Commission, which is where the, where the book of Acts continues from. And that was where my heart was this week, was, was on the repentance. And that was kind of where I wanted to make the main point. So I hope, if, if nothing else, that you just um, understand that we can take application from these things. These, these things that were taught by Jesus Christ over 2,000 years ago are, are applicable to us in our lives today. And we need to recommit our lives to Jesus. It's not too late. We can recommit our lives to Jesus. We can ask for forgiveness, and we need to. We need to rely on the Holy Spirit that gave Jesus the church after he ascended into heaven. So I pray that we think on these things. And my activity for you, the call to action this week, is to go back and read the last chapter of Luke and then go into the first chapter of Acts in preparation for, for next week. But more importantly, pray that God works in us today as he did in the early church. Father, please forgive us. Forgive us for our uncommitment. But most importantly, Lord, help us to repent. Help us to turn to you, to obey you, to be doers of your word, Lord, and not just hearers. You have blessed us with so much. God, we are so rich in your blessings. God, we pray that you would help us share those with others. Give us that boldness. Because it is easier to close the garage door and go in the house than it is to go talk to my neighbor. It's easier to watch TV than it is to open your holy word, the Bible. God, I pray that you change us. I pray that you do a great work in us that changes that. We know that's what the word repentance is, is to change our mind, to change directions. God, with your holy power, give us the power to change, to repent. In your name.